Extra Real Estate Show, and I'm glad you're here. After you listen to it, please consider leaving a review on our Apple or Spotify page and check out any more episodes to see how you can learn more about the industrial real estate market. Well, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Chad, and I'm very excited for another bonus episode of the Industrial Real Estate Show. If you've caught any of my previous shows, you know that I love talking about industrial real estate in either a North American or even a global perspective. I don't mention what city I uh, live in. I don't work, mention what company I work for. I really want this to be a value-add resource as, as a podcast for anybody interested in the topic. So I try to keep a pretty broad Uh, perspective when I can, but I also like bringing in some uh, unique and specialized content every once in a while. And that brings me to this week where I have Dan Fosh uh, from Rare Real Estate. He's the director of economic research with the company. And I've been following him on Twitter for quite a long time now. He posts a ton of great and insightful information specifically about the Canadian economy. So I asked him to come on and talk about Canada. uh, And we're going to cover a number of uh, interesting topics on where we are, what we're what we should be watching for, where there could be some opportunities and where there could be even some areas we want to uh, be extra careful about. We have a great conversation jumping into a number of these topics. I'm sure you're going to enjoy learning a little bit more about Canada. eh? Let's get into it. Hey, Daniel, thanks so much for joining me on the call. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Well, I'm a big fan of your work on on Twitter and Instagram. You put out a lot of great info. I know you just started as director of economic uh, uh, research at Rare Real Estate. Uh, So you've got an invested interest, both probably just from a curiosity standpoint, but also as your job of following the economy and researching what's going on in great detail. So I'd just love to even kickstart it and perhaps set the tone for other questions that that I have for you with just your thoughts on where we are currently. We're sitting here near the end of April, 2023, following three crazy years and probably more crazy years in the future. Where do you put us right now uh, in terms of the economic reality? Yeah, it's tough to say. I think, you know, a lot of people in our industry are really hoping that the recovery portion of everything that's been going on is starting sooner rather than later. So, I mean, I think that it's, you know, very different on an asset by asset basis. Uh, The residential market seems to be kind of falling back into that seasonal pattern. Prices are up basically from January month over month until this month, April, they'll probably probably got one more month left of growth. So you're kind of in that spring market and then, um, so, you know, spring market growth, and then you'll probably see a summer market prices will kind of decline. Um, and then asset classes on the investment side, you know, I mean, we touch, I'm probably more an, um, entry level investor focus. So, you know, less institutional stuff. So I might be a bit out of touch on some of the larger scale, um, although I do try and read a lot of the reports, but um, I think you know the industrial and multifamily markets seem to be still incredibly strong. Um, I think the big question is like, are we seeing market seasonality right now? Um, what are the impacts? You know, the, the big question is, what are the major headwinds, and how are they going to impact the the market here? So, are we going to see a recession in Canada? I mean. Seems pretty likely at this point. Um, how bad is it going to be, and is it going to lead to you know emergency rate cuts? I think a lot of people who are cheering on interest rate cuts are forget what they're cheering for, which is you know a hard landing. Um, but I think you know we've been really surprised by the resilience in in multifamily and industrial, um, and a lot of that I think, and probably you're you're better to to point to it as you know as a result of the onshoring. I think of a lot of things as well as just the growth, general growth of the Canadian economy. Um, and then multi, I think a lot of debt programs as well are helpful. Like you've got BDC and uh, Desjardins and some other lenders have really great programs for industrial end users. Um, similarly, you've got CMHC basically lending exceptionally good money on the multifamily side. So I think where the credit is good, those markets still seem pretty strong. Um, and same thing in the housing market as well. I hope that kind of answers your question. Yeah, it does. And and I would echo your comments as well as it, it really is different from asset classes. I've I'm following industrial basically exclusively, but I still like yourself. You you tend to just pick up other notes uh, along the way. If you hear something about office or you hear something about residential, I, I'm not following that particularly, but I still just I mean, from anecdotes, I, I hear things uh, about it. it. It's interesting on the industrial side, and, and I'm, I'm sure this extends to multifamily as well, is that for a large part, it's driven by population growth. And you can see that in Canada, which has had a ton of 
of population growth, both from outside of Canada, as well as people just moving in, into more dense areas. So that population growth has, has had a huge impact on the industrial sector, multifamily, because there's just more housing needed. Uh, whereas that it used to extend to retail and office, where if you saw population growth, people would spend more money in malls, they would need more office space. But there seems to have been a break in that where we're not seeing that same correlation of increased population leads to increased increase growth in there. What do you think is driving these, these trends is it as simple as just saying it's e-commerce or is there something greater? And I guess I'd just kind of love to hear your thoughts. Is it the work from home? Is that a pretty major thing right now? Or what? what's driving multifamily and industrial to be strong, whereas retail and office are struggling? Yeah, I think it's broad growth in the populace of Canada. Like, you're, you know, you're still seeing, you know, we just saw a a record-setting immigration number or population growth number, and and the, you know the government has clear objective to reach new immigration targets every year, and so more people means more economy. You know, eventually, it doesn't not necessarily immediately because GDP per capita is still in decline, um, but. I think eventually that means um, you know more consumption of goods, and you know we're seeing industrial move more and more to like this last mile world, a lot of warehousing stuff like that, and so they play more of a role in the new direct to consumer retail economy than retailers do, right? And you're even seeing some retail space being used almost in that fashion. Um, similarly, I think like the big trends are e-com, which you know was starting before um, COVID, but really ramped up as a result of the global pandemic, you know, with the restrictions around the way that we interacted with physical space. Same thing with the office. I think we will see a little, and I wasn't optimistic about this for a while, but I think that we were, and I think that this almost is one of those byproducts of um, it, the employment rate um, and being where it is, where employees are really in the driver's seat on economic or on on reopening policy and so i think one of the you know silver linings for the canadian government if they um or sorry the central bank if they can can get unemployment to rise is you know they're putting employers back in the driver's seat and actually trying to get employees back to maybe a, a hybrid workplace maybe 3 days a week where you know there has been a, it's been tough for employers to to be in a, in a position of power in those negotiations for the past little while because the employment market is so tight that people can just go get a job that that gives them what they want. Um, so I think those are like kind of the major trends on office and retail. Um, and I would I think we're going to continue to see industrial be strong. Like the other thing is industrial is a little bit more of an agile supply chain. It's you know ground based steel buildings, so you can build them you know relatively quickly. They can respond to the supply chain a lot more quickly, whereas office, you know, Toronto has millions of square feet in the pipeline. You can't really stop building or change your zoning on an office building that's under construction, right? And similarly, um, in, the, in the condo space as well, like anything that's kind of high rises, you're kind of stuck finishing that project. And so, you you know, you can kind of see these big ebbs and flows in the supply pipeline um, that it, you don't see in the industrial space. Retail, I mean, it's such an interesting one, I think, as we start to see Canada continue to urbanize a lot of those strip malls, they're just not fulfilling their highest and best use anymore, right? And they're all really, really good, centrally located, major arterial, large acreages. They're perfect, you know, master plan, high rise or mid rise sites in a, a get, facing a housing crisis. I think that a lot of owners are just saying, well, yeah, I mean, it, it's retail, but retail is not performing it exceptionally well. Why are we not, you know, taking this thing due to its new secondary plan designation? And, building what is going to serve the most social value and economic value to us as landowners. Yeah, well said. Uh, so going to interest rates, because that seems, well, it's not even that it seems, it is driving a lot of the conversation right now when interest rates have gone up 300, 350 basis points over the past year. I'm curious to get your thoughts on on the market as a whole, and that can be from a homeowner that's Perhaps they were on a variable or floating mortgage, and now they're seeing their their rates effectively double, uh, all the way just to the investment community on how they're grappling with interest rates. What are your thoughts on how the market, which is traditionally very slow to respond to these types of things, as people just have their debt roll over, uh, some people are in fixed mortgages, so it doesn't even affect them. But with the market slow to respond, with interest rates rising essentially at the fastest they have in decades, what's your 
thoughts or outlook on how the market responds to that? Yeah, I think we have like a pretty decent, um, you know, I mean, history doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes. And uh, I think we have some pretty decent comparables for how this magnitude of an interest rate increase would um, roll through the Canadian economy. And and we actually, it was interesting, you know, when we started the Canadian Real Estate Investor Podcast just under a year ago now, the um, the first episode we did was analyzing those past housing cycles and how and so what happened when interest rates were rising in eighty one or what what caused that that so and then the same thing in, in nineteen eighty nine I think nineteen eighty nine is probably a better setup a better comparable setup to where we're at today in in Canadian real estate um, you had an economy that's running incredibly hot you have hitting an immigration record. The last time we broke 1.8% population growth in Canada was in 1989. We just broke that last year in Q2 for the first time since 1989. So what happened was immigration continued to sustain, which is good. You want more long-term residents. But what happened was um, the non-permanent residents started to decline as a result, and those are people who are coming here because of economic prosperity, right? Because jobs are good, filling job vacancies, economies running hot. And what happened was, as rates started to crank up, and they did pretty much the same thing, they increased by a three x magnitude, which is what we just saw, right? Your cost of capital, not just the overnight rate, but you know, your prime rate basically went from two to six percent, or two in the twos to in the sixes. Um, it it really slowed slowed down the economy, and so um, and and. That that put us into a recession. House prices fell from eighty nine basically till nineteen ninety four. I think we'll see kind of. We already saw a big drop off, and again, you saw that in nineteen eighty nine. There was a big drop in eighty nine to ninety ninety one. Were really really bad years for for ho- the housing asset. Um, and and Canada was in a pretty bad sustained recession for the better part of um of the the early nineteen nineties, and it took a while to recover out of that. But it kind of was that long bottom. Um, and so again, I think you know how how bad right. So we're, we've we've passed the magnitude question. We know how bad rates are going to get. They might have a little bit more, you know, they might increase a little bit more. The bigger question is how much time under tension are we going to spend, and how much time can we can we afford to spend as an economy here? Um, you know, right now we're we know that they're not cutting rates tomorrow. They're not cutting it within the next several meetings, likely. And if they are cutting rates, it's likely because we're in a recession and they need to just to re-stimulate the economy and try and fix some of these economic accidents you might call them um and and so i guess the big question is what's your outlook you know for as an investor i, I know what my outlook is but i try and coach people more on using economics to formulate your own market thesis so how bad of, an, of a recession do you think we're going to see as canadians and what do you think the policy response is going to be from the central banks and then especially on the industrial side I think a big question is, are we at risk of trailing the Fed too much and importing inflation? Are we at risk of the Canadian dollar being devalued too much against the Fed if we deviate or we we lag their hiking schedule? And what are the long-term impacts to that as manufacturers or as uh, whole, um, people in the wholesaling or warehousing space or whatever it is? And that would, it would vary on a business-to-business basis. Like Most of your consumers or end users of industrial real estate would probably know the answer to that question for their own business better than I would. But to me, those are the major themes that we're looking forward to uh, in the next, you know, I guess, 12 months. Yeah. I, I like that se- sentence you started with that, does that the, the past doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes. And w- one that I'd like uh, throwing in there as well is that uh, if there is a storm coming in, and personally, I, I do feel that there's an economic storm coming in, that doesn't mean that everybody gets wet. Uh, mm-hmm. Figuratively speaking, there will be some people that do get wet if they're out there and they don't have the figurative umbrella uh, and they're not prepared for this. It could be a rough go. But I think that there will be other people that weather this just fine, whether they're prepared or whether they just have an action plan or whatever it is. Uh, I think that there will be some that do well on the industrial front. I agree. I, th- I think that it will fare reasonably well, if for no other reason than the market is already so hot. Like in Toronto, you guys have sub one percent vacancy rate right now. Mm-hmm. Like that that vacancy rate can go up five hundred times, uh, and and it's not going to be uh, detrimental from a historical Canadian wide vacancy rate. So I I think that there's still a long way to go before there's pressure there, but there unquestionably will be 
pressure and there'll be rain uh, even on that sector as, as consumers will have to start paring back on their discretionary spending. They'll have to start being more cautious and that could lead to slowdowns in those. So I think I think that they probably will affect everybody to some extent. It's just who's who's got a plan, who's in the best position to get through it. And I guess only time will tell on that. What is what is your thoughts? Where do you see when you study this pretty extensively? What, what do you see happening in the next six months? I'll call it rounding out 2023. Yeah, I think we're going to have a, a moderate recession in Canada. Um, I think that probably the worst is behind us for most asset classes. I think maybe except for, I'm interested to see kind of like, I think you're just starting to see this in the CRE space in the States, some of these like, you know, defaults in the office space, big office landlords. I think that that's going to take a while to come out in the wash, probably a couple of years. And, and, you know, there's big lease, um, turnovers that increase the vulnerability. I think industrial is going to continue to be strong. Multifamily is going to con- continue to be strong. Both are running at functionally, you know, 0% vacancies, right? Everything vacancy, basically two per- sub 2% across the country, except for some of the, you know, slightly worse performing markets. Um, and even those markets, you know, they're still healthy and oversubscribed. They just have different floor plates that can't really be absorbed as efficiently as others. So like, I think we have two asset classes that are over oversubscribed and, um, doing exceptionally well. Um, I think that uh, to me, the big theme for Canada is we're going to realize that you can't run your economy on a real estate or housing Ponzi scheme and that we're going to diversify. We're going to have to, out of desperation, diversify the Canadian economy if we want to be able to sustain our economic attractiveness to hit those immigration targets in the you know in the coming decade. Right now, the OECD has Canada at the uh, um, the sl- the slowest growing um, advanced economy in the world for the next forty years. So to now till twenty sixty, I mean that's not a good you know that's not something you go and brag about. And then th- what happens as a result of that is if you're you know if your growth is stagnant and you're um, you know have more and more people immigrating to the country, there's the same amount of economy or less economy, you know same pie, more people to eat it, right? And so what happens is measured by the dollar, the quality of life starts to decline. And you end up with a kind of a phenomenon where like like the US where this disparity can take place as a result of um, you know, policy. And this is why you're starting to hear a lot of economists sounding the alarms a little bit about things like immigration and things like the diversification of the economy. I think as we start to diversify the economy, that to me is the big next big theme in Canadian real estate. And that unlocks a lot of new markets. You know, out where you are, there's a lot of you know, sub- or, or rural areas that are, you know, hot ash and, in, in, you know, in the prairies, um, mining, oil, a lot of these things where Canada hasn't really been playing a major role in those things globally, but we do have one of the most resource, resource rich economies in the world. And, and it's so I think you're almost evolving geographically into like what would be a stock pickers market, where if you pick the right horse, the right um, location, you could really outperform the the market beat the market in in the coming decades if you know if if my thesis is correct and i th- i do think that that's kind of like the the major theme but i think moderate recession by the end of the year rate cuts probably by early next year as a result of this recession this um you know the the um significance or magnitude of the rate cuts will be directly correlated to um the severity of the recession again i'm thinking probably moderate recession i don't think it's going to kill us but i don't think it's going to be nice and i think another big theme that you're starting to see is we're kind of almost in like a k-shaped recovery we're moving more towards a renter's economy a lot of wealthy people took this economic stimulus and used it as an opportunity to allocate more wealth and a lot so it kind of erased the middle class and pushed the upper middle class up and the lower middle class down and you almost have this um the the upward mobility that used to exist um that really excited people about participating in the in the Canadian economy um has has really been um erased for the most part and it's very difficult for people to make that jump from the bottom to the top very much like the US and i think that these are problems that we're going to start to see policy really pushing to try and solve um as we get towards i think again more investment ownership we're seeing a declining home ownership rate for the past 6 years so uh, a lot of like i think just later cycle capitalistic economies similar to the US or even further along in the cycle would be european economies great point i, I guess guess it leads to a question that perhaps doesn't have an answer but is this solvable 
I think um, I don't I don't know if there's anything they could do to solve it today. To be honest with you, I mean, like I I think that they could have done things. I I guess you could reduce the demand side, but I don't I don't see like that that would basically mean having a much smaller immigration target. I think like I don't think there's much more demand side solutions that you could have. Um, you know, the other solution would be on the housing side and and probably on industrial and other asset classes. Anything that's oversubscribed would be built enough quickly, right? So that we're not seeing industrial leasing rates, you know, tripling in the past decade or whatever it is. Um, you know, to to make the economy more competitive and more fair and more balanced. Um, can we do? Can we build enough houses to house all, uh, a million people a year? No. Can we build enough houses to even house the people that we have here? No. Can we build enough industrial to, so that vacancy is not zero percent? It's you know what it was in the in the early two thousands or late nineties. I don't think so. I think that you know policy, and it's not something you could solve with policy unless basically everybody that we were immigrating to Canada was a skilled trade um, or you know a good portion. Um, and and so because you know they you're seeing it at the provincial level in Ontario right now and in a lot of places in Canada similar things happening they're basically trying to open the floodgates for multifamily zoning to to skip the municipal level and even if you did the same thing for an industrial or or any other asset class all that does is it takes the bottleneck from the municipal level to the construction now all of a sudden you've got all of these projects that just got pushed through everybody's looking for trades and now what happens well the cost of construction goes way up because all the trades have uh, you know unlimited amount of projects to build so it doesn't really solve the problem i think it's a very complex problem you need you need the labor side to be fixed. You need the material side to be fixed, and you need the planning side to be fixed if you really want to respond. And the question becomes: Do they even want to fix it? Like, do all of those things? Do you really want to fix all of those things? And I think, based on what we've seen so far at governments of all level, the answer is probably no. It, I want to go back to the one comment you made about Canada being so overly reliant on the real estate sector, and. I wonder if we get into this catch 22 scenario where the solution to the problem, whether it's solvable or even there's an appetite to solve it, the solution is to add more real estate. Does that create a compounding problem that the more we add and then the more wealth that's stored in this real estate, whether it's housing or commercial or industrial, does it become a perpetuating problem that the more we add, the more of a dependence we have on it? I mean, it's not a bad question to be honest at all. I think that if you, you know, if you're using real estate to solve a real estate problem, it could very well, yeah, be a, 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 a negative feedback loop there, right? For sure, I would, I would agree. I think, but the challenge is like, how do you make Canada less attractive, as an example, like, or you know, how do you, how do you, because immigration isn't a forever opportunity, right? Like, it's not like for the next hundred years, there's going to be people all over the world that want to move here like eventually the world starts to settle and you kind of you know in california was like the same thing and like the you know i remember reading arnold schwarzenegger's book everybody wanted to move there at that period of time and now you're seeing an exodus out right like everything goes through cycles um so i think they're trying to capitalize on the fact that a lot of people want to come here now quickly and then i think the, the assumption is you know, you kind of backfill the economy around that later when you have a lot of people, and it, I guess we'll we'll see whether or not it, it works. But um, yeah, I don't I don't know. I mean, chances are we, you know, I think it, it's within the range of potential outcomes that it it complicates the problem rather than fixing it. I think you're you know to what you're alluding to there. I think you, you know it's kind of right. Yeah. Well, and then you add in the economic pie, uh, as you mentioned, is the metaphor is that the pie stays the same, but more people are eating it. That means there's less people or people have less of the pie to eat. What would be the value proposition to someone in this scenario? If if you were tasked with having to give a message to try and bring in people from all over the world into Canada, what would be the message right now? Um, I mean, my message would be probably, and I think you're starting to see this a lot with you know, new Canadians is things aren't uh, exceptionally easy here. Like there's, there, it's it's a very, very tight economy, tight, tight job market. Wages aren't growing. Like Toronto has some of the, you know, I mean, you're moving to a world-class city. If you're going to Toronto, Vancouver, whatever it is, go look at wage to income in any world-class city. And, and unfortunately it's a very competitive labor market and a very competitive housing market. And so the economics of that don't work exceptionally well. Um, so think about, you know, from like in, in, you know, the STEM profession, um, 
might be an exceptional example. Like we're net exporting STEM careers. You know, we train some of the best STEM talent in the world, but a lot of them go to Silicon Valley or the U.S. because uh, the wages in Kitchener Waterloo, where most of them are trained, don't make the economics make sense comparatively. Um, and and so, you know, I, I would just uh, give people like just I would give them the data and say, go look at wage to income, go look or go go look at price to income, go look at. Uh, price to rent, rent to income, all of these ratios, and just make sure that the economics of things make sense. And maybe consider, and this is where I do think another big trend that's going to start happening in Canada is, you know, we're seeing the majority of immigration coming to major city centers, but then what what you see thereafter is provincial outflows. So right now, Ontario is having net provincial outflows, and Alberta, as an example, is having uh, net provincial inflows. They're the, they're the biggest benefactor of provincial migration in Alberta. Um, what So what likely is happening is people come to Toronto because it seems like the most sens- sen- uh, sensible place. They have friends, family there, whatever. They can stay for a little bit or they rent. Um, easiest place probably to find a job. And then they say, oh, the economics of this don't work exceptionally well. Maybe I should go find a place where the economics do work. And then they go to another province, you know, they go to a Halifax, they go to a Calgary, they go to a Montreal, they go to a Edmonton, whatever it is, where the economics start to make sense. And people make economic decisions too. Like it's not just firms, it's not, you know what I mean? And and they will do that. And I think that that's the theme that we're starting to see. And it really is creating a little bit of this renaissance period for some of these smaller Canadian cities that, you know, I mean, Edmonton just broke a million people for the first time. Ottawa just broke a million people for the first time. Um, you know, Calgary has been a huge, seeing tons of benefits, even like a lot of the places, um, you know, Saskatoon, Regina, um, seeing a lot of uh, interprovincial migration. Jo- the job markets are strong there. Calgary has like 90,000 jo- job vacancies or Alberta has 90,000 job vacancies. So the job market is just as strong, but the uh, wage to house price index or the wage to house price is way better. So people can go there and they can actually achieve the Canadian dream that they want to. They can they can get home ownership. They can afford to save for retirement. They can give their their family a good life. Whereas, you know, the the sentiment among young people in the professional space and and you know in the housing market is if you're in if you're in these markets like Toronto and Vancouver, you're very much on a hamster wheel. You're spending everything that you're making, you know, you're not getting ahead. And eventually you just kind of burn out because you don't accomplish what you wanted to in your life and you you stop having that thing to strive for. Um, so that to me is a big, like kind of something that you can't really see in the data, but it's there, I think, personally. Yeah, I think for anyone that can withstand six months of winter, Alberta is a yeah. great place to be yeah. <laughs> for all the reasons you said. It's just those extra two or three months of winter, which seem to grade on people. I don't it's even- funny though. Like, I mean, it's this, this, sorry to interrupt you, but like no. from a climate perspective, like I, I've traveled to Calgary quite a bit. Um, and I find the winters there much more bearable. Like it is cold, very cold. Um, but it's not as, uh, it's not as, um, overcast. Like it's not as like dreary almost. And it's not as, um, and, and like, and I find like, so Toronto is almost like you really get that sad seasonal effects disorder, right? Like where people get, you know, you really get like, tired and um and it, it feels like it's overcast like the whole winter and it's wet right like calgary is very dry cold i think in a lot of cases um so anyway I, I mean it is an interesting comparison but i don't know if they're i think they both kind of suck to be honest with you I mean, the whole weather is probably the biggest complaint about the canadian uh setup here i i agree and i think that that's even talking to uh, uh, people in the states which i probably once a day i'm talking to someone in the states uh that it's probably even worse in their minds than it really is because we get we get beautiful summers and springs and falls. And so I think there's people that have that misconception that Canada is to the North Pole uh, when it does get cold for a period of time, but it is still nice. I if I had the choice, I'd be I'd be living somewhere in the states just for the that better weather pattern because I, I agree with you. Even Vancouver, it's a beautiful city, world class city, just like Toronto, but it's similar. It's rain for all winter, so yeah. I don't know if there is a perfect uh, place out there. At, at least not in Canada. At least not that I've found. Uh, but there's issues in the states too. So I I think that one of the healthiest things someone can do is they just you need to make the best uh, of wherever you're living and uh, if just realize the grass is never going to be greener. Uh, I wanted to uh, get your thoughts on that one point that you made about picking the horse, which horse is going to win the race right now. And I don't mm-hmm. know if, if your answer directly ties into that sentiment that you had about 
uh, the prairies or some of the uh, uh, areas in the country where it's not as priced as high. So people can go and do that. I don't know if that is the same answer that you'd have, but where do you see opportunity? Um, and I guess stated another way, what horses would you be picking right now? I mean, I guess it depends on what asset class you want to be getting into. Um, I think there's still a lot of growth in the multifamily and industrial markets just on on the revenue side. I don't see revenue growth opportunity in um in in either other commercial asset classes. So, you know, office or or retail. I could be wrong, but uh, I just don't I don't see those rents accelerating anytime soon. So I look at like what what asset classes are inefficiently priced. And I think like the multifamily market, like Anything that where you're competing with people buying with CMHC debt, um, it's hard to get a good yield. Um, but if you're assembling, like, so if you're an entry level investor listening to this, and we talk about this a lot on our podcast, but it's like putting together these duplex, triplex. I think a lot of those, like, you can buy them much cheaper than a single comparable, identical single family house that hasn't been cut up to into into a couple of units because you're not competing with you know the marginal end user buyer. Um, so smaller multifamily stuff, duplexes, triplexes in small Canadian cities that have good uh rent or sorry good um price to income ratios um you know you're I th- I I would say they're they're inefficiently priced I think Calgary is creeping up a little bit there but like your Edmonton um both you know most of Saskatchewan or probably the more urban areas in Saskatchewan I think um I don't I think that they're going to be economically resilient again you know that you're more p- making a, a real estate exposure play to the commodities trade which are going to be more resilient um, than you know a tech focused economy like Toronto, a finance focused economy like Toronto, as an example. Um, similarly, like you know, if you're an Ontario listener, um, places with exposure to those trades, you know, if we're getting in more, if we're really trying to get ramp up exposure to lithium mining, to battery metals, commodity metals, you're looking at Northern Ontario, Quebec, um, where you can get very inefficiently priced real estate in the industrial space or in the or in the um, residential space. You know, Northern Ontario, exceptional, the same thing. You can buy below replacement cost. You can buy the same, you know, a duplex for half the price or, or you know, 30% less than an identical um, single family house. Uh, you know, your Sudbury's, a um, couple of places in, in Quebec that come to mind. Um, so I think trying to get exposure to, the, at least for me, like to me, for me, it's trying to get ex- real estate exposure and primarily a, a housing investor. Um, you know, duplex, triplex, fourplex is mostly our stuff. We are getting into a little bit of the bigger stuff now. Um, but using that as a tool to get exposure to where are all these people who are going to go work in the mines going to live, right? Where's all this, how, are, all, how is all this job growth going to impact the housing market in some of these areas? And a lot of them really do have a lot of capital appreciation or like alpha potential um, because, you know, you're, you're, you're seeing like Kirkland Lake, Ontario, as an example, was a city like that all the houses just sold instantly because Kirkland Lake, a gold the gold company, increased their workforce but like substantially. Um, so just like little nuances like that, following economic growth, because that's what's going to drive the recovery, regardless of how bad the recession looks, the recovery will be driven by economic growth, um, not just real estate growth, not just housing growth. It's not going to be a bunch of people chasing renovations and real estate commissions around for two decades like we just did, right? We can't do we just learned we can't you can't run an economy that way. Yeah, well said. So you follow a lot of research and you've got your finger on the pulse of these. So a two-part question for you. Where do you see signs of encouragement that might be coming down the road? And the corollary of that, where do you see things that might keep you up at night uh, for perhaps this being worse than a soft landing? Yeah, I mean, I, I think oil is i mean if it's if oil stays tight and it continues to be economical for you know canadian oil to be oil and gas to be um doing well then that to me is a sign of strength and it might actually help us scrape by in you know whatever kind of downturn we see globally i think the financial sectors um you know i think that's probably a big question mark canadian banks probably the most um, exposed if you're looking at a kind of a global perspective to to uh, what could happen or what is kind of happening with a lot of the the um, U.S. banks, you know, your regional banks or more niche banks. Um, I don't know if there's a lot of risk there, but I think finance tech seems to be laying off quite a bit. So, like um, asset classes that are heavily exposed to tech and um, 
and or or multifamily markets that are, are heavily or like just housing markets that are exposed to tech. I mean, California seems to be like kind of you know a pretty good poster child for what you might want to worry about like <laughs> heading forward. They kind of just seem to be the canary in the coal mine right now, right? A lot of office buildings in in kind of these more. I don't know, like really tech focused, really like socially progressive areas seem to be kind of doing strange things right now. Similarly, housing markets, I think most of the big declines in the US are happening in California. Um, watching what's happening in places like that and saying, could that happen here? Are we going to see you know some Canadian financial institutions suffer as a result of exposure? Yeah, maybe a little bit. I mean, I don't think the Canadian banking system is going down anytime soon. It's globally um, significant and, uh, and frankly, too big to fail. Like the government will backstop it by all means. But um, a lot of people just watching what's going to continue to happen with the Canadian housing market, our interest rates going to push consumers to to the edge. And, and the big, big question becomes, I mean, you've got credit card delinquencies rising, credit card debt rising, auto delinquencies rising. I mean, all of these things are pointing to a, a marked slowdown in consumption, yet we haven't seen that actually happen yet. So I think people are still kind of debting by, right? And rather than getting by. And the question is like, when does the next kind of shoe drop? I don't really know, to be honest. I think that there will be some sort of catalyst. Something's going to break probably sometime soon. And I'm not saying I hope for this, but I just, I don't see an outcome in which we get that soft landing. I think a lot of small things have been breaking and I think there's probably something, you know, bad that happens and that we're kind of like, oh yeah, we're in a recession now. And and then we, you know, it, it sucks for a bit. And then we re the big thing to me is, you know, cycles happen for a reason. You can only grow so fast for so long. It's got to break. And then especially for, you know, a younger generation in the real estate profession, like the, the, that is our first opportunity as a, for a bull run, right? Like a real, real from the, from the bottom recovery bull run. And so that to me is what's exciting. It's like, I'm already thinking about what's on the other side of a recession rather than and so that to me is like what i think what i encourage people to really think about it's like figure out how to you know whatever it is what do they say tighten your tighten your belt or whatever it is for for the for the little period of time scrape by and then let's let's figure out where to make the the money and the and the big change on the other side of it such a great outlook and one of the reasons that i I've, I've enjoyed following along with you as long as i have is uh, detailed in in how you just explained that First, you you don't sugarcoat things. Like you're presenting the facts as you see them, and it sometimes they're good, sometimes they're negative. Uh, but having that information can be the difference between making a right decision and a wrong decision. So I I've really enjoyed your perspective on that, and equally so, even even just how you said you don't know what what this does. I think that that's that's the most honest answer anybody can give because we have no idea what's going to happen tomorrow let alone what's going to happen in six months. So I, I think it's all we can do is we try and interpret and synthesize all this data that comes in and you just make the best decision you can with all the information you have available. And, and I really appreciate it and I've enjoyed following along with you on that. I haven't dug into any of the podcasts yet because I'm usually tuned into your, your spaces on Twitter or just following on your posts. Uh, maybe just tell a little bit more about the podcast because I'm sure people would love to hear more too. Yeah, sure. So you know, we run. Um, it's called the Canadian Real Estate Investor Podcast. It's uh, I think it's the most listened to um, real estate podcast in Canada. We're typically you know in like the top five in the investing or business categories on um, on Apple. Um, really broad market discussion about how to invest in real estate in the Canadian market. So we'll go like as granular as like talking about what a cap rate is, or you know how to calculate different return metrics, or you know what what are the five most expensive things to fix as a landlord, you know, in any type of asset class. Um, and then we'll go, you know, we we do cover a lot of macro and policy, um, interest rates. You know, we did one on the monetary policy report today. Um, we do a little bit of interviews, but not a lot. So we just had Chip Wilson on the podcast as an example, um, the billionaire founder of uh, Lululemon. Talk to him about his industrial portfolio in Vancouver, his uh, office portfolio in Vancouver and Seattle. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's really just like kind of s- supposed to be really like just full scope real estate investing podcast. And it's kind of got something that appeals to like the very, very beginner all the way to like, you know, we have some big institutional guys who listen to the podcast religiously. So it's been been kind of interesting in that respect. Yeah. We just try and create value for as many people who touch and feel real estate investing in Canada as we possibly can. 
Yeah, well, I'm sure if it's anything like your your the value that you add on Twitter and Instagram, it's a great product because I, I agree with you. I think that as a producer of a podcast myself and as someone that loves podcasts and just taking in new information, you can tell. You can tell the difference between someone that does it for some self-serving purpose, whether it's right. just marketing or brand awareness versus someone that's genuinely trying to add value. So I'll, I'll check that out. I'm, I'm a fan of Chip. Uh, I don't think I'm wearing any Lululemon right now, but I am a Lululemon fan as well. And so is my wife. So I'll check out that episode for sure. Uh, I'm, that Probably a neat place to wrap up, but I still do want to just give it one more promotion so that people can get a hold of you on Twitter and Instagram. Uh, can you just share those? And I'll also, when I'm editing this, I'll pu- put up a, the handles as well. Yeah, for sure. Um, I usually just, because my last name is so unique, I usually just recommend that people Google me because um, then it'll it'll kind of just like give you the platform that you're most likely to click on. So um, Daniel Foch, F-O-C-H, but on Instagram, it's uh, Daniel Foch. Uh, on Twitter, it's Daniel underscore Foch. I couldn't get the um, the proper username there. And then everything else is just Daniel Foch, uh, first name, last name. Um, so like TikTok, I do, I try and be on all platforms. It is obviously really tough as I'm sure you, you know, but, um, but yeah, I, I love, uh, just like having conversations about real estate. So if anybody wants to reach out, let me know how you like this and just talk about it. Argue with me if you want. I like, our, I like arguing in, uh, on, on social media as well. So, um, I, I love it, uh, to connect with any of your listeners or anybody who wants to chat about this. Awesome. Well, I appreciate all your insights on this and I'd love to keep in touch and perhaps if you're up for it in the fall, maybe we come back and look back at some of the uh, uh, things that we were were looking at and some of the research and see if we were on the ball or if we were off and and I'll maybe tee up a little uh, comments that uh, are questions that we can get into a debate about because I'm the same way. I I love getting into a healthy and respectful debate. So maybe we could... uh, we would have like a battle where I have like some boxing gloves in and we'll try to. Yeah, we could maybe. I, I mean, we, you and I could probably debate uh, multifamily versus industrial asset class pretty well, I imagine. Because I think I would probably, like, and a lot of it maybe is barrier to entry, but like I have a hard time getting into industrial, right? But I, and I, and I, so, so I've really become a multifamily investor, but I, I would, I would love to maybe have that debate, is which is, you know, the king of the asset class is under 2% vacancy, right? Let's um, tee that up. That'll be fun. Yeah, 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 that would be fun. And similarly, I'd like to to have you on maybe as like a recurring kind of guest to just give us a little bit of an industrial market update um, every once in a while on our pod just to to see what's going on. It's always t- always tough to uh, like. So maybe we'll just reach out to you for a couple of sound bites there. That'd be perfect. Yeah, I love talking about it. So anytime I can shine some light on the topic, I'm more than happy to. So yeah, let's definitely keep in touch. Uh, I'll have this uh, edited over the next couple of days. I'm going to Montreal. Uh, tomorrow, but I'll I'll probably just do it while I'm on the plane and uh, aim to have this out by Saturday. So I'll send you a copy as well when this is when this is out. Amazing! Thanks so much, man. I appreciate Thanks, you. Man. Appreciate it, and we'll be in touch. If you made it to the end, I really do appreciate your support, and I'd love to hear what you think about the current state of the economy or where we think uh, things are headed for the rest of 2023 or perhaps even into 2024. Leave me a comment below, and if you like this video, please me leave me a like or leave a dislike if you didn't like this video. I like feedback of any kinds, but we really do want to thank you for getting this far. Have a great day. Well, I hope you got some value from that episode. I always enjoy getting to speak with these guests. Again, if you got any value from this, please leave a review on our Apple or Spotify page and look